So in this lecture we will cover plastic deformations and especially we will try to estimate using a very simplistic model but nevertheless a model that should be okay to estimate the order of magnitude for the yield stress values. And the course is of course solid state physics and we are covering the mechanical properties of solids. <clears throat> And, and what we will do in the following lectures is that the, like, uh, we will rely, realize in this lecture that our simple estimate is not enough, it's not at all adequate. And this, this result really motivates to look into defects and crystal imperfections. And that's, that's the reason why we will, after this lecture, we will be covering point defects and dislocations. So that'll be the subchapter 3.3.2. And after that, we can finally go into the subchapter 3.3.3, where we are elucidating the fact that role, sorry, the fact that defects really play a role in plastic deformation. So that's the, the outline on plastic deformation, which is the middle part in the stress strain curve we are we are looking into. So let's get forward. We will now go into estimation of the yield stress value. And, and let's remind us where we are. So we are now in the plastic deformation regime. Not all materials do have this regime, but some of them do. And, and when we are there, basically we know that they, we have gone beyond the elastic deformation regime of solids. And this is what we considered earlier. And now we start dealing the regime when the applied stress sigma exceeds the value of the yield stress sigma y. And after this, we the deformations of the solid become plastic. So the, something becomes irreversible. The dimensions of the solid do not anymore re, like return to the original dimensions when we when we vanish the, the stress when the stress is reduced to zero again. <coughs> and now what we want to do is that we want to understand that the, how can we estimate this this point of no return this this yield stress value sigma here because that's that's where we move from elastic deformation regime into the plastic deformation regime so that's what we want to do here in this lecture <clears throat> and we want to estimate uh, an order of magnitude and and how do we do that we want to do um, estimate that for the yield stress value and and like i mentioned it's a point of no return for the solid, so that, that's why we are interested. So we want to know when the transition is being made into the plastic regime. <clears throat> so let's now actually start calculating. So when... when <clears throat> and, and let's, let's, okay, not, not yet calculate the things, but let's go first into kind of uh, introduction why we are interested. <clears throat> So when when the stress has exceeded the yield stress value sigma y, solid does no longer return to its original shape, and and this this happens even after the sigma has decreased a below of sigma y value, and even at, at zero uh, stress, like uh, we are no longer uh, returning with the material to the original original strain value but rather something like work hardening may happen so that they, we were actually, when we are returning, when we are reducing the, the amount of stress we have applied into the material, we re reduce that to zero. Then we do have some resi residual strain in the material. And this, this really means that it's no longer in the original shape, the material. <clears throat> and this is quite nice uh, value to try to estimate because um, this is of uh, very, very strong practical reasons why we, why, why we care. So, uh, <clears throat> for example, um, when we are thinking of those Lego bricks that we may have in our homes, we certainly want to ensure that when we are playing with the materials, playing with the Lego bricks, we, we can still happily keep on residing here in the elastic deformation regime and we do not need to go to the plastic deformation regime because that's where where things become irreversible and we start breaking down our toys and, and the same kind of arguments may may be used for other kind of applications 
depending on your material and depending on the problem <clears throat> this is also often where you want to be and you want to know like uh, where is the limit where is the hard limit you do not want to exceed so that uh, you can still operate on, on this linear and, and reversible regime and, and that's that's why why we why we care here of this yield stress value and now finally we, we are trying to estimate the yield stress value so that uh, we will start with a conceptually simpler case and and let me remind you that if we can estimate a yield stress value for shear stress so basically the yield shear stress value earlier we we, <coughs> we discovered that the elastic constants they are often interrelated so if we can provide an order of magnitude of the yield shear stress tau y then we, that also can use that value can also be used to estimate what is the yield stress value, and that might be the, the value that we are more interested, in, especially when we are looking at the stress strain curve, and, and we are like trying to understand how a solid is being deformed under a tensile test. <clears throat> but this is simpler case. This is easier to draw and try to understand what happens, and and that that this will be used to provide us an order of magnitude. For the yield shear stress value. So we consider a case, and uh, the simplest we can imagine is that uh, we take the hexagonally closed packed lattice, as shown in the figure below. And when we look at the B, we see that the angle alpha allows to estimate the yield shear stress tau y value. And, and <clears throat> we can do that simply that the, the value alpha is it's the tangent, inverse tangent of x over a. So let me look what are the par parameters here. So A is the, the separation between adjacent layers. And then X is the amount of uh, deformation along this direction. So essentially like when how much we are being deforming. Uh, the moving the upper lattice with respect to the other one. And, and this is by definition gives me the angle. And now if the movement is small, we can approximate that the, the inverse of tangent is just close to the itself. So we can just approximate that alpha is x divided by a. So that they, they, we can only just, <clears throat> based on the fact that the sine of alpha for small alpha values is, is roughly alpha, and the cosine of alpha is close to unity, and this, this gives us the approximation we can use here for the tangent and the inverse of tangent. And now we can estimate that what is the yield stress. And by a definition, that's the G, the shear modulus times alpha, the shearing angle. And now we can place in, in terms of alpha, the G over A here into the equation. And now the largest uh, displacement X that we can have, that will be the B term here. That is shown where in the figure. Okay, here. This is the, 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 the interlayer uh, separation of atoms. And, and this is the largest value of x that we can, we can have. So that the, the atom moves from the original equilibrium position to the second equilibrium position here. So the kind of, we are looking at the scenario that how much we need to, to move the upper layer. And, and there will be this, this kind of... Uh, work we need to do we need to push the upper layer quite a bit so that it can get overneath over over the layers over the, the other lower layer atoms and then when an equilibrium is being found then the, the layer is on, on this second equilibrium position <clears throat> so this gives us the maximum value for x and that gives us the, the estimate for the yield shear stress value to y so that is equal then to gb divided by a <clears throat> so this is our estimate and i admit this is a very rough way of calculating things but it, it does provide us some kind of order of magnitude at least and and we could try to be more sophisticated but the end result will be the same so physically we we can perform experiments and we find out that this estimate that we have for the yield shear stress value tau y is off by several orders of magnitude. So this value that we estimated 
it's far larger value than we are experimentally seeing. So that something really happens more, more a lot differently in realistic solids than, than this simple uh, consideration <clears throat> we have outlined here. Like a simple simple model and simple piece of maths, math predicts that we have outlined here. And this is really the, the thing we wanted to show here in this lecture, because this is what motivates us on the next section when we are focusing on defects. And, and defects are actually sometimes when they are important, they are very important when we want to understand the properties of solids. And it's very good to try to form at least some kind of overall understanding <clears throat> that in, in what cases, in, in which scenarios defects matter and, and, and in which cases they do not matter. And, and it would be good to try to understand roughly from the microscopic point of view that they, how defects matter so that they, you would then be able to kind of use this intuition that you may be able to develop and, and then, then predict some, some properties of, of materials when, when you acknowledge the fact that we have defects there. But I will stop here and I will, <clears throat> I will follow up in, in the next chapter and there we will be speaking more, more about point defects and dislocations. And, and we will see that they actually can explain the huge discrepancy we see between the experimentally measured values for the yield shear stress value and, and the, the values that we can estimate based on this simple, but, but nevertheless, a relatively like a intuitive model we described here on this lecture. So I thank you and, and please join with me in the upcoming lecture when we are focusing into the defects. Thanks and bye-bye.